Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to all of you. Um, thank you very much for joining breakfast at UM Health Talk today and uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all Muslims. Uh, my name is uh, Prozamri, Head of Pharmacology Department. Uh, I will be a moderator for this session today, okay, for this morning, for the first session. Um, some housekeeping information uh, about the talk. If you have any questions, uh, you can use the chat box or you can wait until uh, the talk finish. Then uh, I will open for Q&A sessions. Okay, uh, first, uh, allow me to give brief introduction on our speaker for today. Um, Dr. Hassan is actually currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Pharmacology. He obtained a Bachelor of Pharmacy and Master Degree in Pharmacy from the University of Aleppo, Syria, and recently graduated from his PhD in Pharmaceutical Technology from the Department of Pharmacology in 2021. His research specializes actually in drug delivery, if his current interest is in the development of a nanoparticle for the treatment of cancer. So we are delighted today to have Dr. Hassan, who will talk about uh, mRNA vaccines development. Uh, the title of his talk today is uh, mRNA vaccines from a pharmaceutical point of view, pandemic mitigation using nanotechnology, him to deliver his talk. And uh, Dr. Hassan, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hassan Mustafa. Uh, thank you very much for, for the introduction. Uh, I will start by uh, this webinar by talking about the title is mRNA vaccine, uh, vaccines from a pharmaceutical point of view and then mitigation using technology. Uh, in this talk, uh, I will try to focus on the pharmaceutical and industrial aspects about the, this technology, and I will avoid what is uh, more commonly seek uh, by physicians and by the general public about the information about the uh, uh, side effects and toxicities and efficacy of, of vaccines. Uh, first note I want to mention is that nano uh, mRNA vaccines are actually a, a nanomedicine. And to talk a little bit about uh, nanomedicine, uh, since the mid uh, of last century, uh, nanomedicine was envisaged as this miraculous uh, tool that we are developing to make these uh, small robots that can get into the uh, bloodstream and into the body and go to uh, target sick cells and uh, try to cure them or, or get into these uh, evil pathogens and then shoot uh, laser beams at them or even uh, miniaturize the Apollo mission that went to the moon and make it into a small ship that can actually go into uh, the blood vessels and uh, carry a crew and then fix whatever wrong with, with the body. Uh, but all these promises uh, were not actually fruiting as expected. And in the last two centuries, uh, a lot of talk was happening in the scientific community about the complex realities of nanomedicine and what uh, uh, promises that it should actually manage to deliver and not deliver. And this is not uh, only uh, contained in the uh, academic community, but also it went into the news and people were talking about nanomedicine having a delivery problem. And discussions until early into this pandemic were about the challenges in nanomedicine were all over the academia and uh, uh, beyond that. Uh, so talking about uh, the recent realities, uh, uh, scientists realized that this uh, complicated multidisciplinarity of the field of nanomedicine, uh, um, where we need to uh, uh, collaborate between basic medical scientists, in, uh, basic scientists, sorry, in the fields of chemistry and uh, physics uh, into engineering and uh, material science and uh, uh, medicine, whether it is in preclinical and clinical stages, all these uh, scientists needed to tailor their uh, research methods and change their uh, perspectives to suit this new field and uh, 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 innovate in the terms of uh, making new uh, uh, tests and new uh, assessments to uh, 
see if these materials that are being developed are suitable for a human consumption and they are safe and not toxic. And uh, they needed to redefine how, how to uh, assess their efficacy. And so did the governments that needed to uh, update their uh, regulatory frameworks. And uh, all this complication led to a uh, slow introduction of new nanomedications. And when these nanomedicines, after many, many candidates being researched uh, preclinically and clinically, um, very few of them end up in the uh, late stage of clinical trials, and much less of them actually succeed in passing clinical trials to the market. And no clue about that more evident than the fact that uh, uh, both uh, um, Moderna and BioNTech, who were tasked with the development of the new mRNA vaccines, uh, both of them, they did not have any product uh, rolled out in the market before, nor did they, uh, they make any profit uh, before uh, the pandemic. So speaking about before the pandemic, uh, mRNA vaccines actually can be uh, traced back to the discovery of mRNA itself in the early 60s. Uh, and also to the discovery of uh, liposomes, the notion that uh, we can assemble uh, lipids into B-layered uh, vesicles that uh, uh, mimic the structure of uh, a mammalian or an animal cell. Uh, and then we can uh, put um, medicines or genetic material into this uh, nanoparticle and then deliver it to the human body. Uh, and the first successful attempts to deliver nucleic acid into the body uh, or into human cells uh, were actually done in the 80s, where they delivered the DNA. Uh, but this transfection process uh, was not efficient enough to make a medication, and it took until the 90s, uh, where one of the most important uh, discoveries uh, in this field, and the most important uh, discoveries in terms of uh, the current bottlenecks in the process, which is a discovery of ionizable uh, cationic lipids. Uh, and... Uh, uh, to make this uh, technology uh, scalable and industrial, another discovery had to be uh, done in the 2000s, uh, where they discovered that uh, the easiest way to uh, large scale produce these uh, uh, liposomes, that after uh, adding cationic lipids into them, they were now defined as nano lipid nanoparticles instead of liposomes. So, to make these uh, lipid nanoparticles, uh, on a large scale, the best way is to, to, to do it using uh, microfluidic technology. Uh, where microfluidics that uh, uh, borrow tools from uh, uh, engineering lithography and uh, integrated circuits to make uh, uh, the new medication. So to talk about the structure of uh, a lipid nanoparticle that contains uh, genetic material in it, mRNA. Uh, the um, diameter of a nanoparticle or a lipid nanoparticle is uh, less than 100 nanometers. Uh, it contains, it's composed of a shell and a core. Uh, on the shell, there is a lipid layer that is composed basically of uh, lipids that are attached to polyethylene glycol. The role of this polyethylene glycol is to uh, cover the nanoparticle with a hydrophilic layer uh, that makes it uh, uh, hide from the immune system and makes it uh, non-immunogenic. Uh, and then the structural uh, body of this uh, shell uh, is formed of cholesterol and phospholipids. It also contains a little bit of the uh, positively charged ionizable lipid. Uh, we can see it here and here. Uh, and the uh, neutral ionizable lipids uh, also. Uh, and in the core of the nanoparticle, we can see the genetic material, the mRNA, uh, entrapped inside the core of the nanoparticle with the help of these positively charged lipids, forming uh, polar uh, bonds with the positively charged lipids, which helps keeping the uh, mRNA inside the uh, liposome and not leak out of the particle. Uh, I would like to stress that the most important uh, component 
currently in this uh, lipid nanoparticle is actually the, the positively charged lipids in terms of interstellar ability. Uh, so what the positively charged lipid does is that uh, the complex that is formed with the genetic material uh, inside the uh, lipid nanoparticle, uh, when it is uh, uptaken by the cell and moved inside the cytoplasm in a form of an endosome, uh, what happens here is that the pH uh, drops uh, immediately from uh, about uh, pH 7 into 5 or 4 inside the cytoplasm. And this will trigger the release of uh, the genetic material, the mRNA, into the uh, cytoplasm, and then it gets uh, transcripted uh, inside the cell. Uh, so the uh, positively charged lipids here help us entrap uh, the genetic material inside the nanoparticle at the first place, and then release the genetic material in the cytoplasm. Uh, so how the development and the manufacturing process of mRNA vaccines looks like when we identify a new threat, a new virus, uh, and then the sequence is published online. We don't need the, the virus to be isolated and delivered to us, just we need the sequence. We make our uh, own sequence uh, uh, from this information, and then we amplify it using an enzymatic process. We don't need cells. We don't need the original virus. Uh, and then in this uh, small uh, bioreactor, uh, we can uh, make uh, millions and millions of doses, uh, very highly concentrated, and the purification process using liquid chromatography results in uh, mRNA in a, a quiescent uh, buffer. Then we take this aqueous buffer that contains uh, mRNA, and using the microfluidic technology, uh, we mix it with uh, uh, the lipids that are forming the body of the nanoparticle. The lipids are dissolved in ethanol. And when they are mixed, they form the nanoparticle immediately. Uh, uh, after that, we need to purify this nanoparticle. Basically, what we want to do here is just we want to remove the ethanol. Uh, using uh, technologies like tangential profiltration, and then uh, we can adjust to the uh, uh, desired volume and then send it to fill and finish. So this whole process, when it is uh, GMP certified, from the identification of the threat until the fill and finish took about 45 minutes in the uh, 30, uh, 45 days in the case of uh, Moderna mRNA vaccine. And this is as opposed to five to six months in conventional vaccines. So uh, um, uh, this uh, this uh, process actually uh, can be said about it that it's safe. So the whole development process does not involve the work with the virus itself. It has a very small manufacturing footprint. Uh, uh, actually, one of the scientists who are involved in the development uh, put it like this, uh, millions of doses of mRNA vaccines can fit in uh, or are transported currently in boxes, containers uh, that are the size of a Samsonite bag. Um, uh, also, this process is uh, very fast. Uh, as we said, uh, it's very low in cost, and one formulation is very flexible, and with it can uh, give us uh, many uh, uh, products for many diseases, many variants of the same uh, disease, and it uh, evades the problem of the immunogenicity of the vector itself. Um, actually, these are the scientists who uh, developed uh, the mRNA vaccines, talking about them early into the pandemic, before um, um, the efficacy data come out from Pfizer and Moderna. These people, they actually expected all these positive outcomes, but they also expected a limited immunogenicity, and still they wanted uh, the mRNA vaccines as the easiest tool to use for pandemic mitigation. Uh, so in reality, what happened during the pandemic response, all these positive aspects did not in reality come out in what we desired. So half of the vaccines that were produced over, uh, all over the world were actually of in inactivated vaccines. And interestingly, the other half, 
was not mRNA vaccines. It was uh, a quarter of mRNA vaccines and another quarter of uh, viral vector vaccines that are actually the most difficult to produce and the most costly. And this can be noticed and it affected the pandemic response in Malaysia. Uh, so in June and July 2021, we were at the peak of the vaccination campaign. And uh, we can see that um, in, in this month, uh, our rollout of Pfizer vaccine was at its lowest uh, to 30 to 35 percent of the vaccination. While we depended in, at the peak of our vaccination campaign uh, on the inactivated vaccines from Sinopharm. And this is what led Mr. Khayou uh, Jamal Din, our uh, uh, health minister, to talk about vaccine hoarding by greedy countries. Uh, and uh, how did the uh, uh, mRNA vaccine supply chain work during the pandemic? We can see that until uh, June uh, 2021, all the firms that worked with the mRNA vaccine from the pre production to uh, uh, drug, uh, drug substance, the mRNA manufacturing and the formulation stage to the fill and finish, all of it were in Western Europe and in the United States. And this goes uh, uh, the same for Moderna and for Pfizer BioNTech vaccines. Uh, this was not the case for the Western vaccines that are developed uh, uh, using viral vector vaccines. Uh, both of them were uh, had involvement of Asian firms, uh, mainly from India, uh, in the case of Johnson and Johnson, and from India, uh, Japan, Latin America, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, namely Thailand also, uh, in the case of uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. So the question arises, can we make uh, vaccines, particularly mRNA vaccines in Malaysia? Uh, well, yes, and uh, we are already trying, uh, although it's challenging and difficult, but it should be done at least partially, if not fully. Uh, we have the experience that can be mentioned about uh, uh, Cuba uh, that was praised by the WHO and by the academic community all over publication from the uh, biggest journals. And they, they produced vaccines using a uh, protein subunit vaccine, another vaccination uh, uh, technique that is suitable for the pandemic, but is uh, not as developed as mRNA. And they actually managed to uh, uh, vaccinate the whole population in few months. And uh, although they were much later because their vaccination technology is uh, outdated compared to mRNA vaccines that were rolled out in the United States, they were also um, much later in the start of their uh, onset of their uh, campaign, uh, they were much more efficient. And in few months, they man managed to uh, uh, vaccinate a, a lot more of their uh, population compared to uh, the United States. Uh, uh, and actually, Malaysia followed uh, or had a similar uh, vaccine roll, rollout pattern, we can see. Uh, in few months, we managed to, populate, uh, to uh, vaccinate all of our uh, uh, population. And one can say that if we had the tools of mRNA vaccine technology, uh, at our disposal, uh, probably it, uh, it is possible to um, uh, start much, much earlier to, to in the vaccination campaign. And uh, as compared to uh, the United States that uh, use mRNA vaccines, we, we could have expected to start seven to eight months earlier. And this could mean with the efficiency of our uh, vaccination campaign and the discipline of our population that actually took the vaccination without any hesitation, uh, this could uh, actually save uh, thousands of lives and uh, make our uh, vaccination rollout uh, much, even much, much, much better than it was. Uh, and uh, now the mRNA vaccine is not uh, manufacturing is not just uh, happening in the West, and China is now uh, building plants that uh, can produce billions of doses inside China. So the scale of process, we can say that it is optimized outside the collective West. Um, 
And uh, even in Indonesia, with the collaboration of China, they actually managed to produce uh, uh, mRNA vaccines. And I think it is already rolled out uh, in Indonesia and manufactured in Indonesia. Uh, so to sum up and have some conclusions, uh, mRNA LP nanoparticle vaccines are much faster to develop and produce, have the smallest manufacturing footprint, and cost a lot less than conventional vaccines. Uh, this gives uh, the mRNA technology a tremendous potential for vaccine-led uh, pandemic uh, mitigation, and no other uh, vaccination technology can deliver the same. Uh, an organized effort on the national level to master parts or the whole sum of this technology can improve the pandemic response, as well as proper collaborations internationally. Uh, I want to stress that the bottleneck in the manufacturing process is not the production of the mRNA itself, it's rather the production of the nanoparticles and the encapsulation of the mRNA in them, and the bottleneck in the supply chain uh, was uh, in the supply of the and the sourcing of the highly specialized expensive cationic beads, and here where comes the the most important patenting. Uh, another other is important aspects are the efficacy, the immunogenicity outcomes, the pharmacoeconomics, and the geopolitics uh, of the production. And uh, it's also important to say that mastering the mRNA drug delivery technology is, uh, has promising benefits beyond just pandemic mitigation in uh, cancer treatment, in uh, uh, normal vaccine rollout campaigns, uh, not necessarily in the pandemics. And I think that's all for my talk, and thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hassan for this very interesting talk on uh, mRNA vaccines. I think most of us actually uh, recently received this mRNA vaccine, especially during the you know uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is produced by uh, Pfizer. Okay. Um, do you have any, uh, I would like to open for uh, Q&A sessions. If you've got any, anybody would like to ask anything uh, in the next, I think we have about six more minutes to, to finish uh, the first session. Okay, there's got actually one actually uh, on the chat box. So, Tarsan, can you please explain the exact difference between the AstraZeneca and Moderna vaccine in the light of what you have explained so clearly uh, from Mike Chan? Um, thank you for the question. I, I would like to go back to my, uh, uh, sorry, my slide. Uh, technologies. Uh, are are new and have not been tried before. There is uh, when we came into the pandemic, both uh, technologies did not have any precedence uh, before in the market. At least uh, the the difference basically is in the uh, first is in the vector. Uh, so the viral vector is a virus instead of a lipid nanoparticle. Uh, usually they use in in this pandemic they use adenoviruses of different uh, subtypes. Uh, and uh, uh, the genetic material that they deliver is actually DNA. Uh, the advantages of viral vector vaccines is that they are uh, hypothesized to be um, much more efficient in uh, delivering the genetic material. Instead of delivering mRNA that uh, into the nucleus, they, uh, into the cytoplasm of the cell, they deliver DNA into the nucleus of the cell. And this is hypothesized to be much more efficient. Uh, another, uh, another thing uh, is uh, um, sorry about this. Uh, and another thing is that uh, the viral vector itself uh, is a virus. So the most important drawback uh, about uh, this virus is that it needs to be produced similarly to the inactivated vaccines, the old uh, old fashioned traditional vaccines. Uh, so the the process is costly, and adding the complexities of uh, making the viral vector itself, it makes it even more difficult and more costly than conventional vaccines. Uh, uh, however, uh, and we have the the, the problem of uh, the uh, uh, immune, um, immunogenicity of the vector itself, uh, as opposed to the. Uh, innate nature of the uh, uh, polymeric nanoparticles that deliver mRNA vaccines. Uh, 
Okay, I hope this answer the, the the questions. I think since there's no more uh, questions, uh, um, any, any other questions from participants? Okay, if there's no more questions, I just have one question before we finish today. Um, Asad, you mentioned just now that actually, um, okay, if we, if we understand that until now, there's no single vaccines produced by any Malaysian pharma or, you know, by Malaysia, uh, biotech companies, okay? So, in your opinion, what is the, actually the greatest challenge faced by you know, local pharma or biotech companies to produce the first vaccine in Malaysia, uh, especially mRNA vaccines? Okay. What are the greatest challenges faced by them actually uh, to produce the first one? I think uh, among the most important challenges is sourcing the materials mm -hmm. uh, themselves and making these novel uh, materials that actually for example, the, uh, a lot of uh, secrets and patenting is covering the uh, cationic, uh, cationic lipids. Uh, uh, and also the manufacturing process itself that is new and uh, is not uh, tried before in Malaysia. Uh, in Malaysia, we already have uh, uh, manufacturing processes that, that are similar to conventional vaccines. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, but we don't have, and actually even that is challenging enough. Uh, and a lot of contamination and problems I've been told that uh, face this uh, technology uh, in Malaysia before that led to closing of uh, factories. Uh, so uh, I would point out to two, uh, uh, two challenges. One is the sourcing of the lipid, uh, the uh, highly specialized lipids that uh, uh -huh. uh, I would advise that we can actually develop on our own using our uh, research institutes uh, and the um, uh, optimization of the manufacturing process that haven't been tried before. Uh -huh. As mean, in, in other words, as mean, our pharma actually uh, industries is still not actually uh, they ready with the you know the manufacturing process of the mRNA vaccines. Yeah. Yeah, but so is mo most of the world. So we and we are in the same. Uh, I mean, we are racing from the same uh, from the same start point. Uh, okay. I think that uh, this is also an opportunity in this way. Okay, I think this is great. I think I hope that actually one day. I think uh, I think we 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 have to work on from from now on to actually. Uh, come up with the first version of uh, vaccine, especially as you mentioned, the mRNA vaccine is actually uh, much more easier to prepare than the conventional vaccine. We hope that uh, one day uh, our pharma company or biotech company in Malaysia able to produce the first mRNA vaccine. So I think uh, we actually uh, reach the limit of the time. So um, Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan, for your uh, sharing on the MRA vaccine this morning. I hope that um, every, everybody got actually some very fruitful information from the talk today. And have a nice day. So I would like to pass this to actually Dr. Associate Prof. Uh, Dr. Najib from uh, Department of Phys uh, Physiology uh, for the next talk. Thank you very much.